listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 296. Andy's uh, just popped by uh, before uh, he sets off for the TGO Challenge, which is, uh, takes place in a couple of weeks' time. So here we are, uh, literally the, uh, the beginning of May. And we thought we'd take a, a, a few minutes to discuss some of the developments in, uh, in stoves and um, the change in interest towards the, the wood-burning variety uh, and the variety of uh, fuels that you can use now and how much it's becoming a common um, area of interest around the world. And also, uh, we'll also have a chat about um, his approach to the challenge this year from a gear perspective as he's going on his, uh, on his own this time and not with his partner, Kate. Uh, but first, to, to stoves. We've literally just taken delivery of the new titanium uh, Avenue stove, the, uh, the mess burning stove, which sort of combines with its windshield to turn into a, a wood burning stove. And also, literally uh, new on the market is the new Vargo titanium folding wood burning stove. Uh, another hexagonal stove that's come on the market. Plus, of course, um, we have our own honey stove, uh, and as an extension to that now, we have a, a larger version, which uh, will take the honey stove, and with a few extra panels and a little bit of um, uh, an extra plate, uh, it turns it into uh, eight sides and a much larger surface area. Um, so we are doing our bit to promote uh, this approach to using organic matter, uh, something that's a little bit more, or considerably more environmentally friendly than, than gas stoves. Um, if nothing else, because I think we've all um, known, had the experience of shaking the gas canister and never knowing exactly how much is left in it, so you can't take it on the plane with you. You, you, know, you want to, to be confident that you're going to go cooking for the next week or so, so you tend to bin half a canister and, uh, and then buy a new one. And of course these canisters are, are non-recyclable uh, and uh, sadly just end up as landfill uh, and uh, possibly um, you know, dangerous items if people throw them around and, and throw them into fires, which sadly has become a common practice, I believe, on, on some of the uh, music festivals. So much so though, they're now actually banning gas stoves on music festivals. So it's, it's starting to, the interest in, in alternative safe uh, effective, um, fairly lightweight and efficient um, organic matter or meths or alternative fuels is, is certainly growing. But um, I thought I'd sit down with Andy for, for 10 minutes and, and discuss some of the new developments and, and get his, his impressions because this is the first time he's seen some of the, uh, the new ones, particularly the, the Hive, which is the larger honey stove, the Evernew Titanium and the, and the Vargo Titanium. So with that introduction in mind, Andy, um, you know, what are your first thoughts on this? The, the point about canisters is, is an interesting one, isn't it? Because you... The advantage of a canister is its convenience. But what I think we've seen in recent years, particularly with the new meth stoves and these new multi-fuel stoves, um, that they're becoming very convenient too. I was in the Cairngorms for a week in November, pretty cold, it was, you know, down to minus seven, minus eight at night. Um, but I just used a meth stove. And they're getting so small and simple now that the convenience advantage that a gas stove has has gone. And then, of course, you've got all these environmental issues you talked about. Um, and what we're seeing here now is um, people beginning to push out into the wood-burning stove much more. And um, regular listeners will know that we're both big fans of wood-burning stoves. Um, but you do need a backup with a wood burner, don't you? Um, you know, the last time I was in the Pyrenees for two or three weeks couple of years ago i took the um, the bush buddy which was a great stove to use it was lots and lots of fun but we did have two or three dreadful dreadful nights where you just couldn't have cooked anything um, and although a lot of the promotional stuff from the u.s says you know well you can use, use these in wet weather and all the rest of it you can but it's a hell of a hassle to do it so something that combines the two um is the way to go, I think. But it is interesting seeing how some of the major manufacturers are now beginning to think through the wood-burning thing. Uh, and, and we've got a, um, an array of really interesting options here. Um, this is one that interests me, which is the Varga one. Now, Brian Varga is well known for his um, small, innovative titanium products. And the, my first impression of this I don't know, was a, a bit underwhelming, but the more you play with it, the cleverer it is, isn't it? I'm not quite sure how you describe it, though. So, 
You have a crack at that. Well, uh, it's it's a hexagonal stove um, with hinged sides. Um, uh, one of the comments that people have passed on the on the honey stove is because it's uh, um, uh, six panels which need to be linked together. Um, people felt that uh, when uh, when their hands were cold or whatever, it might be difficult. Uh, it has proven not to be, with people have actually deliberately uh, got themselves in a cold state to see if they can uh, get the fire going, bushcrafters in particular. Um, however, you know, it's an understandable concern. And the um, the Vargo stove, although it's, it's smaller in both uh, diameter and height, um, it's sort of taken a, a few of the technical innovations and ideas... Um, there was the original um, wood burning stove that started us off actually um, several years ago when we went for a podcast on the on the hills and I had a folding one. Do you remember that heavy yeah, duty yeah, folding yeah, one yeah, yeah. and that was made in Israel. It was an Israeli army uh, item uh, and for some reason that suddenly came to to um, end of its line, which then started me down that the honey stove route. But that particular one was uh, a rectangular stove with two angled ends which faced each other. So it's the same principle of actually concentrating the heat yes. within the, the sort of pyramid shape. So if you, if you imagine you've got a hexagonal shape which you put on the floor and then you've got this hinged um, set of folding shapes, you pull the hinge up, start to unfold it... And what you end up with is something that looks rather... I mean, it's got something of the Caldera cone shape about it, hasn't it? So it's, it's, a, it's a cone, and just uh, clips into the base there. It's very rigid, so we're not talking about foil here. You wouldn't be able to damage this. Um, it does fold away perfectly flat and sits in a really nice little... Um, uh, uh, pocket thing. Now, one of the things that worries a lot of people about the cold air cone system is the fragility of them. And actually, that's an issue with the bush buddy as well, isn't it? The well, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you on the the, um, the fragility. And, and funny enough, there was a comment somebody placed on, a, on one of the YouTube videos the other day that I'd put up about um, the, the bush cooker and the honey stove saying that basically um, it's going to be slower than a, a gas canister and nowhere near a stable. Well, you know, it just felt like he was completely missing the point. Again, it was somebody from the US, uh, completely missing the point. The base of it is actually wider than the gas canister, and it's no different. You know, you, it's common sense. But the whole point, or one of the attractions, I'd say the whole point, but one of the attractions about these types of products is that it slows you down. You know, there isn't that sort of come on in, flip the light on in, in the house and turn the gas on. It's, it's the whole process is being one of, a part of your environment, certainly. Yeah, and we were, we were talking about this earlier simply because I'm here buying my last-minute suppliers for the TGO Challenge. Now, in Scotland, when the weather's really bad, there is a tendency to shove your tent up, jump inside, and that's where the canister stove scores you, switch it on, and away you go. Where the weather is better, so even in the summer, or particularly I find when you're in European mountain ranges, that the wood-burning stove, A, it, it's very easy to use because you've got dry wood around, but it is a much more pleasurable experience, and, and I think you have to you have to try that to really understand it, don't you? There's something slower, just naturally more organic about picking up wood and sticks. And now this Vargo stove, for example, we've got it set up now, and it's like a rigid cone in sections, um, and it looks a bit underwhelming. There's a little door you can open. One of the sections opens a door, and you put your wood and, and tinder in the bottom of that. But, of course, if you've got a very small alcohol stove as well, like a, a white box or even the little triad that they sell, and you take that with you as well, you've got the perfect combination of the two. And it's a very simple, robust kit. You're not going to damage it. You're not going to break that. Um, and particularly in European mountains where you always have difficulty worrying about the supply of gas, um, and the different systems. I mean, I, I found a couple of years ago that taking both a meth stove and a, a wood-burning stove, when there were two of us, gave you all the versatility you wanted and, and a lot of security. So that Vargo thing, very, very simple, very light, well, about just over 100 grams, I guess. Um, yeah, and I, 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 you know, he, he doesn't often get these things very wrong, does he, Brian Vargo? And that, that's a nice-looking piece of kit. He certainly um, has thought it through. Um, I, I looked at it, and uh, unlike the sort of the honey stove, which is actually has more versatility, 
to it. This would, I think, would suit somebody who has had a passing interest in having a backup as a wood stove or wanted a pot support and windshield for yeah. any type of mess stove, really. Probably the more the top burners rather than the side burners. I mean, the honey stove is far more flexible, far more adaptable. Um, maybe, not be some, maybe not something you'd want to use quite so much on very lightweight, ultra, ultra lightweight backpacking trips. Um, but certainly, you know, for kind of casual camping, um, overnighters, weekenders... Um, it's great because of its versatility, really is a boon. And we know how popular it's become with the bushcraft community. Um, lovely people. They don't tend to walk that far, though, do they? <laughs> but, but, I mean, they do kind of like nothing better than to spend um, their weekend in the woods somewhere. Now, your hive stove, which I've got here, which is the kind of eight-sided version, um, is, well, it looks as if it's almost twice as big. I'm, I'm not sure if it is, but that... That in itself, if you think about um, a static campsite um, or a, a, a bushcraft camp, that's going to knock out some heat, isn't it? It's got mm. some capacity. And it's also strong enough to, to support a big pot. You know, So, I mean, I'm just thinking of some of the stuff I've got at home, but some of my bigger um, alley, um, stainless steel pots with you know, good bases to them, you, you'd have no problems cooking on that at all. And also, I mean, you, you, it, part of my reasoning behind that particular one was actually I started using two honey stoves instead of my barbecue to barbecue a small amount of food for just Rose and I. Uh, it suddenly occurred to me that with a little bit of work, you've actually got a contained barbecue there, which has got a, a base which yeah. is adjustable, folds flat again, relatively light. Yeah, I mean, and it, and it is that size, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely perfect for, for, for doing something like that or, or using it at home. Um, I... I've used my bush putty at home, actually, to, to kind of cook on in the garden in the summer from time to time. It's a bit small, but when there's just one or two... Mm. But that, the hive, uh, is perfect for that. So I think for static camping and um, uh, bushcraft people, it, it is ideal. Um, and I guess that would also kick out quite a bit of heat as well. It'd keep you quite warm. <laughs> Well, it's certainly, that, again, it's back to that social aspect, isn't it, of any of these wood-burning stoves, is that once you finish cooking on them, you know, a handful of fuel will give you something to talk around and chat around and it'll generate some heat. But you're not wasting gas and you're not wasting meths. It's, it's, it's sort of making use of the, of the surroundings. But let's move on to this, this new avenue here, which I've got tucked inside this um, pot, and see what you think of that. I know we've had a play with it outside. Um, let's see what Andy's thoughts are on that. Uh, this is a very, very interesting piece of kit. It's um, it's titanium. It's very light. It's very high grade titanium, and it's clearly very well made. Now, it, what, what you've got here is you've got a, a titanium alcohol um, burner, uh, which can take quite a capacity of alcohol. We saw earlier. Uh, and is a very efficient burn and burns very quickly and and a very strong heat. Uh, but it's titanium and it weighs very little. 30 odd grams, I think. Yeah, and then what we've got is we've got a base unit, which is uh, effectively a kind of, I don't know, about an inch and a half tall, maybe a couple of centimetres, well... Don't get your centimetres and inches, Mitch. I, I know, I was just thinking, though, <laughs> I always stick to one. But it's... Um, uh, and it's uh, it, it's like a uh, uh, looks a bit like um, one of those big little um, uh, things that people used to be very chefy. You know, they, they, you see them on these cookery programs now. They build up the little twins. It's about it's about it's about that size of, of a cooking ring. And then there's a, a, a so that's Actually, I'd think probably compare that and say about the, it's about the diameter of a drain pipe. Yeah, yeah, but then you're more DIY or <laughs> So if you if you're DIY, it's a drain pipe. If you're a, a bit of bit of a chef, it's a cooking ring. <laughs> anyway, so there you go. It sits on the floor, and and you pop your burner inside it, um, and then you've got a second uh, a, a second uh, collar? thing collar. Yes, a technical term. Is that what they're yeah, second, a second cookery ring, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is slightly perforated. And that just slips over the top. And so what you've got now is you've got the, your, your stove in the base unit, and then you've got a windshield around the top of it. And uh, if it's very windy, you, I noticed earlier you'd made just a little simple thing with a bit of foil that you folded down to, to, to cut the, um, some of the, the 
the wind out of the top perforations. But but there you've got a very enclosed, um, very sturdy, very, very lightweight package, which you can put a, a pot on it. You have to do that without any problems at all. Nice and stable. Now, I think that, I, I think that is a very interesting piece of kit. And, and um, you take the burner out of it, um, which we'll do. And there's a, there's a kind of little grill thing in here. We just slip, slip that inside it, do we, I guess? Yeah, yeah, just lots of those three. Yeah, yeah, okay, so something like that. And, um, and you've got a wood-burning stove. Now, it's, um, anybody that's used something like the bush buddy or something like that, it, it's, it's slightly smaller, and uh, you would use it with small twigs. Um, but it would work. Now, just thinking back about my experiences in places like the... the, the, the the Pyrenees and those kind of European Alpine mountains. I reckon that might be the perfect thing to take with you because you could take, I don't know, you know, 500 grams of meths, use the meths burner, uh, and when you've got a bit more time, when you stopped early in the day and there was a lot of wood around, it, you've got that fun experience, that relaxing experience of using real wood, but it really is very light. Um, how, how light again? It's just over 80 grams. 80 though. grams in total. Um, Maybe a little bit on the pricey side, but having said that, it's a really quality piece of kit, isn't it? And um, beautifully made, high-grade high titanium, and exceptionally light. So I have to say that's probably the most exciting stove I've seen since the Bush Buddy. That's a very interesting piece of kit, that I think. Interestingly, the, the comments there on the price of titanium, it, it is worth bearing in mind that... Um, uh, we're getting, we are getting used to seeing titanium much more in the outdoors, and obviously there are different grades from different countries. The, the grade apparently from from China is is uh, of a lower grade than than um, the Japanese grade. But um, the bottom line is, just for an example, that the honey stove is a thirty five pound stainless steel item. I actually had that quoted in this country and also in America to be made from a medium grade titanium. And it would have gone to 160 pounds. So, you know, it's it's quite frightening what it would actually cost if you source the material in this country. And in America, it was no better because you always had all the import duties as well. That actually the Asians are doing this very very well. And although it is expensive compared to some of our cheaper items, it actually is pretty good value for money. Yeah. Well, one thing I'd say though, in, in comparison with some of the stainless steel. Um, it's obviously there's a weight saving, there's a, there's a premium weight saving here for, for using the titanium. So if you're really into lightweight backpacking and you, you, know, you do what a lot of us do sometimes, you want to do a, a, a long weekend or even a couple of weeks trek and go very, very light, this is perfect. But actually the weight premium for using stainless steel is not that great mm. if you think about it in all. So if, if you're taking something... Um, where you're going to be, you know, you may be in high mountains and you know you're going to be not going to be walking for 12 hours a day, you're going to have a good rest at the end of the day and, and the weather's going to be reasonably good and you want, you want to have a bit of fun, then, then, then the stainless steel is more adaptable, it's more versatile. And, and your honey stove, I mean, the thing about that can be used as a grill. Um, what I liked earlier when we were looking at the, the, the hive was you can combine it with a, um, a kind of grill thing too. You know, you're back to your fishing again you know if we ever manage to catch any fish <laughs> on one of our tips we'll be able to grill it perfectly with one of these so and i think you do need to think about that and, and you know do you uh, okay we want to we want to cut down the weight and we want to make backpacking more pleasant and sometimes you want to go very, very extreme but the weight premium isn't that much but if you do want to go for the weight premium this this little Japanese marvel is fantastic. One thing I was going to ask you, um, when you went to Scotland taking the, the mess burner, did you uh, find, talk about the, sort of the finer details of carrying weight or whatever, with, with meths, uh, I understand that uh, for the equivalent amount of heat output and duration compared to gas, you actually end up carrying between 10 and 20% more meths in weight which for a long weekend is probably fairly negligible. Would, was it something that you were at all conscious of at all? Um, I am conscious of it. I'm conscious of it on longer trips. So, um, uh, for example, talking about the TGO Challenge, I've not actually taken meths on that before. And I am, I've thought about it several times. I'm thinking about it this time. But I'm also thinking about the amount of fuel that I'm going to have to carry or, or have access to. That is an issue. I think if you're doing a weekender, 
it's not a problem at all, you know, because you can store the stuff. Uh, you're using small amounts of it, and some some of these small uh, stoves are very alcohol efficient as well. But I have noticed that, and um, the last time I was in the Pyrenees and I got a meth stove, I uh, wanted to buy some alcohol, and there you, you go to a hardware shop to buy it, and it comes in litre. But I thought, God, <laughs> that's rather too much there. Um, and most of the time I was using wood, but it's surprising how much you get through. It is. You you do get through the quantity of it. And also, just to pick up on that, I mean, the, what was the price of it at that sort of uh, later? Only a few euros, sure. Oh, nothing. Um, and that that is one of the... I mean, it, it, I get a lot of emails about this from people going over there because um, in these very tiny villages, you can't often get coal and canisters, and sometimes it's difficult to get hold of the, the French camping gas stuff. Um the great thing about using something like um, meths, which is called alcool de bruyere or something like that in French, um, is that you buy in a hardware store. Now, anybody that's been to France knows that any village has got a hardware store. Most supermarkets have got the most wonderful solvent sections, <laughs> <the> kind of <laughs> glue stiffers, paradise. So you can buy this stuff, and you buy it in big litre um, containers, and I think it, it seems to be a slightly purer... Um, than the meths we buy in camping shops. So there's no problem getting it. But because you're buying a domestic product from a hardware shop, it costs virtually next to nothing. Mm. Yeah, it's very cheap, very efficient. Uh, just finally, I suppose, it'd be worthwhile as I reach across the table here, just actually talking a few minutes on the pot cosy. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get the time to get a video done because I started actually uh, um, measuring and um, calculating the heat loss with or without pot cosy, which will be released uh, shortly. But um, I know that as we developed and uh, both got in more involved in wood-burning stoves and meth stoves and stuff, we've also obviously been using the pot cosy, which I find a very, very useful addition to the cooking system, both on a fuel basis and also on a, on a pacing and, and reconstituting dried food. Um, I haven't really talked to you about that of late. Have you, have you had good experiences? Have you got any neg anything negative to say about it? No, nothing to say at all. I, I mean, if, if you if you look at how cheap that stuff is to buy, uh, and you sell it in convenient kits forms, um, okay, you have to make you cozy yourself. It doesn't take you very long. It's probably one of the best things you can do. Uh, before these came along, if you remember, what people were doing halfway through their day. They were stopping, adding a little bit of water to their dehydrated food and then using the, the movement of, of the walk to agitate the food and, and, and whatever. And that was a bit hit and miss, I was used to find. Um, but with this thing, there's none of that messing about. You get to camp at the end of the day, you bring the, the container of the food to a boil, stick it in the pot cosy for 15 minutes or something like that, and then you've got perfectly reconstituted food. And, it, and they... While this stuff looks very simple, I mean, it does keep the stuff absolutely piping hot for a long, mm. long time. So really, I mean, nobody should go into the mountains on long treks without a pot cosy now. And um, I, I guess people don't. I mean, uh, I think there's been a massive habit change around these things. Everybody takes them for granted now. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think you can equally make just uh, equally efficient ones out of old roll mats that have sort of fallen apart. As, uh, yeah, Colin, Colin Ibbotson does that, of course. He, he refuses to buy anything. And uh, uh, Although I think he end, I mean, a lot of Colin's stuff uses... Uh, Sleeping mats. I think he spends a lot of money on sleeping mats, though. <laughs> but, but there you go. They are light and they are permanent. So, but that's um, yeah. The pot cozy system, I, I, I think, is, is fantastic because you just don't have to worry about quality dehydrating. And some foods are more difficult than others. If you dehydrate your own stuff, I've always found chicken quite a pain in the bum too. Uh, a bit easier with a with a pot cozy. <laughs> You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Well, we're well on to our second cup of coffee now as we uh, continue our conversation about um, the, uh, the forthcoming trip. And although it's the TGO challenge and maybe of not, uh, of not great interest to a certain area of our, uh, our listenership, uh, it's certainly uh, the topic that we're, we're looking at now is really how it differs to approach um, a trip like this, which is a two-week long duration uh, walk, uh, as a solo um, hiker as opposed to as part of a couple. Uh, and we've both got sort of fairly strong views and experience on this. 
So I thought it would be interesting to, to touch on it and just see how the uh, mindset has changed and also the approach to the equipment that we would consider using when we're not actually taking our partner. Um, so really, I'm going to hand over to Andy, really, to, to start the ball rolling with, with his thoughts to how his approach is uh, going to be changing this year and, and how it has been different to his uh, previous walks when he's, uh, he's gone with his partner, Kate. It's very different, I think. Um, you know, it's always nice walking with somebody. Um, it's, I think it's a very different experience walking on your own. Uh, and it, it's almost the ideal, I think. It's, it's, you know, it sounds a bit callous. It sounds as if, you know, we wouldn't want to go out walking with Rose or Kate or whatever. Well, of course, that's not true at all. <laughs> but it's a very different experience. And, um, uh, and there's all kinds of practicalities around that. I mean, you set your own timetable, you set your own pace. Um, when I'm walking on my own, I tend to I tend to get up early. I tend to start walking earlier. I can walk later. Um, uh, the routes tend to change, or the the options for changes are there. I mean, it, you, it, uh, you've talked to me a lot about the responsibility you feel when you're walking with somebody else, and I think that's true. So you know, you wake up in the morning. I think, I think on this year's challenge, day two, I should be camping at the base of a, of a mountain and, and, and want to nip up and walk along the ridge. Now you wake up in the morning and there's a lot of mist on the mountain or the weather's pretty crappy. There's more debate about that when there's two of you and you, and you probably play safe more. Whereas if, you, if you're on your own, I'm not sure you're taking risks. You're not really taking more risks. But, you, but I, I, think, I think the, the routes tend to be more challenging or at least you give yourself more options I think as to as to how to do that so it definitely feels a different kind of experience plus you know if you've got one of these wood burning stoves or something you can play around your heart's content on that um but I, maybe the best thing I think is that you can set your own walking pace and I, I for me I find that quite a big thing I mean if I'm walking with Kate she starts off walking much faster than I do but then doesn't walk as long during a day and I, I kind of get conscious of that that you pace yourself better you, you you create your own days and then of course there's the whole mental aspect of it is completely completely different because you're you know you, you, you might walk for two or three days without really seeing anybody um you know, are you going to get bored with your own company? Well, you don't. There's all kind of things you can think about. You tend to take in the landscape maybe a little bit uh, more closely than you would do otherwise. I mean, it's a very, very different experience. I think um, I agree with everything you said, really. I mean, the, the certainly the key difference is, although, although Rose is, you know, a grown-up and she can make her own decisions and, um, and certainly has her own opinions, um, the there is this this moment of of checking the other person's okay all the time your partner's okay all the time and all, it does work the other way around as well but it does seem to be predominantly the um the, the male of the party as it were it does tend to take con control and take that upon their shoulders whether that's just uh, hereditary or the way you've uh, you know the the, the animal instinct in us. I don't, I don't know. It's being the alpha male that you are, Bob. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what. One of the things that um, has, st has struck me as well is that, and um, because I get quite a lot of emails from people who who are just about to set out on their first, you know, solo backpack for a week or two weeks, uh, and quite often they've been walking all their lives and haven't really done it. And there's always a bit of nervousness about it in terms of safety and risk. I think probably when I walk on my own, I, I am a little bit more safety conscious, but not in a way that's any, any way onious. Um, I mean, over the last couple, couple of TGO challenges I've done with Kate, I've ended up sinking into my, my waist in bog on both occasions, um, simply because I've been just been going too fast. And I sometimes think maybe you, you just kind of, you, you, you just, you just kind of, a, blind a bit to safety whereas when you're walking on your own you do have to think a little bit more about it you know uh, crossing a bog maybe being a bit more careful um walking high on an exposed section i don't mean to say that's a really heavy consideration but but you do i can only think of once when i've really got into difficulties which was well, it wasn't really difficult it was just funny really i was on my first tgo challenge actually coming out of um, Malague and um, I was feeling quite good and one of the things about that route on the TGO Challenge is you get off the boat and I know you've experienced this 
ready to walk and everybody else turns left and goes into the pub and you think what's all this about you know <laughs> you don't understand the social side of it anyway the first day I shot off I think you did this as well didn't you much further than I was going to do on the first day and I was coming into I think it's called the, the there's the forest at the top of um, uh, Glenda Sowie there and um, I met a local and he said to me, oh, don't walk through the middle of the middle of the wood. There's a, the, a, a much better walk, walk around the outside. And then there's a new path, not on the map. And it, it just cuts into the middle of the forest and it, it's a far better route. So I thought I'd do that. And I got to a, uh, um, this, this walk into the middle of the woods, found a, uh, got to a point where there was a, a slight chasm. It was a very, very deep ditch. I don't know, it must have been 20 feet more than that. Um, you could, it was just too big to jump over. And there was a plank that had been put over it, and this plank was rotten, was rotten to hell. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to have to go back all the way around again. No, shall I go to the plank? And I kind of got onto the plank, edged forward, and the inevitable happened. Just as I was about to pull off and jump to the other side, the plank went crash, rather like a cartoon. You know, I kind of swung on my walking pole, smacked into the side of this thing, and, and kind of slipped down the side of it and I do remember thinking then and that was a bit silly really because nobody else on the TGO challenge would have been going that way because yeah. nobody else would have met that bloke you know so I think you do have to think a little bit more about safety but it's not it's not something that's an overwhelming consideration really I think there's, there's also a positive to it without trying to sound too cautious about these things and, and the difference is just a case of, of an awareness uh, certainly Shirley for example as a, as a solo walker always been a solo walker although she likes the, very much the social side there's a the, you when you're walking with her, her approach to where she's going and what she's doing is actually quite, um, a, a, you know, different to mm. when we met up as a couple, as it were. We were walking with her. Whereas when I've walked with her as a solo and we just happened to bump into each other as we were carried on, there was um, a certain... I know what it is. It actually reminds me as well when I've also walked with, with Lee. You don't feel responsible for that other person and then actually it takes away something that makes the, the, the solo part of the walking much more pleasurable. I mean, it is, a good, it is a good time. Solo walking is a good time to do all kinds of things. I was writing about this just last night, that, you know, I, I kind of, I, you kind of get into a zone at this point before a trip. You know, you're working like mad. Have I got all my preparations done? Have I got all my gear ready? You know, I've got all my food sorted. Then there's work, you know. Have, have a, can I finish everything off before I go? What, what jobs can I... I do I have to do before I go? Which ones can wait till I come back? You know, and if you work on your own, which clients are going to be happy leaving things a bit long? And you've got that mad rush, haven't you, to get everything done before you go? And then you kind of collapse into it. But I always find on a solo walk that about this time I begin to crave that that kind of peace and that mm -hmm. that I'm, and I'm I, you know I'm really looking forward to it now. And I'm beginning to think, well, there's all these things that I haven't sorted in my life, all these decisions to make. You know, the long walk is exactly the right kind of place to do that. You never do. I mean, I, I never find I do. I don't ever come back thinking of it. But you do come back feeling, um, I don't know, whether it's more relaxed, better. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a it's a great experience walking on your own. Um, you can also do you can also be more extreme. I mean, my kit this year is going to be a lot lighter. Yeah, let's talk about kit for a bit because uh, uh, that's that's that will be interesting to see. And if you wouldn't mind just mentioning what you took as the alternative for uh, the previous year when there was two of you. Mm. Well, um, with two of us, uh, we take a tent and we take a double skin tent, and it's pretty light. It's about I don't know one point. No, it's just about two kilo kilos. Really. The Terra Nova 2.2, yeah, yeah, solid 2.2, just just about two two kilos, which is one kilo each. I know it never quite splits down like that. So, um, and that's a double skin tent. Um, and uh, this time, I won't be taking guitar, but I'll be taking this uh, Mountain Lowell um, Duo Mid, which is is effectively like a, a kind of go light hex type thing which is but he's made out of uh, cuban fiber it's very light just about 300 grams but it's single skin so we, we've got this single tent uh, we've got this single skin uh no ground sheet um so and it's cuban fiber so it's very very light now with a single skin tent and no sewn in ground sheet you know do you take a ground sheet or not I choose not to. It's just something else to get wet. Um, but I do have a uh, mountain level BV bag, which is, has a breathable top and a bathtub waterproof floor. 
Now, for a lot of people sit and say, well, that's not very comfortable, is it? But to be honest, you know, you've had a long day's walk, you get into it. Um, I mean, I just jump into my sleeping bag, into that straight away, and I'm perfectly warm and, and cosy. But, it, but you know, it, I can't get Kate into that. She just will look at it, and there's no, no way in a million years would, would, she, would she get into that. So it's, it's much lighter. Uh, obviously, the stove cooking equipment is much lighter. You know, I just take one pot, one... Um, uh, MSR um, kettley thing, um, no mugs or anything like that. So I really do take the bare minimum when I'm on my own. Um, Can I just ask something? Because I know yeah. that um, coastal trip that we did um, earlier on in the year, or last year now, isn't it? Um, I had the uh, the new Shangri-La three, the, the the hex, as you say, the Shangri-La three with uh, same sort of thing, just uh, sleeping on uh, on a mat. Um, and the wet grass, there was long wet grass, lumpy grass, I think, as I remember where we camped. Uh, and unfortunately, I had the unpleasant um, sensation of a slug <laughs> crawling across the top of the I sleeping bag that, yes. onto my face. I've got a silver line in the morning. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, with uh, explain to people how you're using that, that uh, duomid. Um, with you're inside a bivy bag. Has the bivy bag got some sort of mesh covering to protect you from that type of you know unpleasant attraction during the night? Yeah, it does. It has um it has a mesh net which is rather like a kind of mosquito net, a little mesh section, which you can you can zip shut, so you can have it open or you can you can have it shut. And there's a little uh, attachment that you can put a kind of bungee cord thing up to the top of the roof of your shelter or. There's a, a a very thin wire frame which you can bend to to keep the net off your face, um, but it does work very well. So it means you don't really have to worry about bugs or slugs. Um, I mean, you do tend to wake up in the morning and see them instantly. I mean, you know, the, it's, it's Scotland; these big, long black slug things. You know, um, they come and keep you company, but, <laughs> but but there's no there's no slime left in the morning. So it's it's a, it's a much lighter weight of kit i mean the only problem with doing that is you sit and think well okay my shelter's going to weigh 300 um, grams instead of uh, a kilogram or a kilo and a half you know so the danger is that you then start thinking well i've got a bit i can take some more stuff with me now so before we know where you've gone you you've got more stuff than you need to do but but i do carry a much much lighter system than i would be on my own so fundamentally then, apart from the, the cooking gear, which is obviously smaller and, and lighter, and I think the jury's out at the moment whether you're going to go meth, wood, or, or, so, or a mixture of both, and the shelter, is everything else pretty much what you'd take when you're with Kate? Yeah, um, I mean, clothing, for example, I just take the same, more or less the same stuff each year. There might be a bit of a difference this year, because I think I might take these new lightweight Pamo trousers. Um, I mean, I love Pamo stuff in the in the wet, and I use the third element jacket, which is brilliant British backpacking jacket. But the trousers are just too heavy and and just too warm. But these new Velas ones are lighter and they're warm. And I might just take those this year. So um, I usually have one base layer. Oh no, so two base layers. Base layers, both merino wool usually, or merino wool and silk, um, and. Uh, I take a spare pair of trousers, and that's because of the social side of the challenge, you know, because you're into pubs and, and hotels and things like that, and I might not take those anyway. Always walk with one pair of socks, with a with one spare uh, pair do you of take, um, do you, I know you use Terox, but do you take um, Crocs or anything like that just to give your feet something different in the evenings? No, and I'll tell you what I did last, last time, I was in Scotland last year, and, and I thought it worked very well. Um, I've always taken in the past a pair of sandals, um, and you know, yeah, I thought, they're well, heavy things. they're heavy things. Everything's, you know, it was actually going walking with Colin's a bit of a problem because he just looks at everything in your bag and says, "What are you taking that for?" So what I did last time, I I bought a pair of seal skin socks years ago, and I, I think they're useless to walk in. I have to say, I don't like them. Um, but I thought, well, maybe in the camp in the evening they're great. But what I found was good of those. Um, when you get to a place where there's civilization and you want to go in a, a pub or something like that, rather than mess around with what's wet socks, I just put those seal skin socks on and I could quite happily walk around all the evening in wet shoes, you know. Mm. So that was quite a good combination. So I take so I take the, the socks I'm walking in, which are X socks and they're th- th- completely synthetic, they're very light. I take a pair of smart well, ones back up but also keep the feet warm at night if it's cold. And then I take these um, seal skins now, 
um, which effectively replace a pair of sandals. And that's about it, really. What about um, just quickly touch on, on on food or any luxuries like that? Is there anything different you've done regarding your diet or any of the luxury items you might take with you that you wouldn't normally consider when there's two of you? Um, no, it's the, it's the same kind of stuff. I kind of th- there is something I think you have to watch out for, and and this is something I think all salt people looking at doing a, a significant solo walk for the first time should think about I have a horrible tendency when I'm walking on my own to not take enough food for the middle of the day mm. I did it on my first challenge I thought well I've got lots of dehydrated food good even- meal in the evening I'll just take power bars with me during the day which was an absolute nightmare because you know you, you know a who wants to be eating three or four power bars a day and and they really don't do you justice um and um when I walk with Kate, she's much more organised than I am about lunch, you know, so we'll have we'll have uh, pita bread or rolls or cheese or something like that, which makes a big difference, I find. Now, I mention this because when I was in the Cam Gorms with Colin just before Christmas, um, I just automatically fell back on the old power bars thing, and you don't half notice it. And I, so I think, um, certainly for me, one of the things I've realised is that you that if you've got a big chunk of cheese it'll stay it'll stay fresh in your backpack for quite a long time in the middle of the pack pita bread or tortilla wraps or bread rolls or something uh, if you're in the high mountains in Europe or somewhere and some of these kind of high mountain sausages are brilliant because they last forever but even 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 cooked ham you know wrapped up properly will last you for four or five days and for me that's one of the biggest things i have to think about it's too easy to skip lunch and i find after two or three days of skipping lunch i really notice it mm. i must admit I t- yeah again agree with you as a solo walker you can keep persuading yourself to push on i remember you saying mm. about the first crossing you did that you were actually a day ahead of everybody else mm. and which is the same mistake i i, I fell into on the first crossing i did and there was nobody to talk to, so I kept going. And then got to a body, and yeah. there was nobody there, so I kept going. And so much so, I actually did two days in the first day. And then the follow because it was during really hot weather, and I was actually, I wasn't doing lightweight in the slightest, but at that stage, I completely ruined my feet. I mean, I know we're talking generically, not just about the challenge, but, but there was always people listening to this who were thinking about doing the challenge. And it is just worth reiterating, don't plan to do too much during your first day. Because the first challenge I did, I really didn't meet anybody until I got to Tarfside, maybe <laughs> towards the end. And it was only at that point that the social side of it made sense, really. So, um, But this, this business about food, I think, is probably the most single significant thing. I mean, there's, there's a great pleasure about food as well. I mean, the, the, I agree with you. With Rose is the same. She, she, she does insist on lunch. It's the actual experience of stopping and appreciating your surroundings. But what we did, we certainly did the last trip, and we would certainly incorporate now in any of the trips that we do, is every couple of days we'll go via a village. And we'll pick up some baby bell cheese because that's sealed, so that works all right. As you say, some meat perhaps or a pork pie or, I mean, Shirley loves her pasties. handful of fruit, that'll keep us going for a couple of days. And that, that augments the other food that we've got. And also now, depending on the fuel that we're cooking with, if we're doing wood burning, then we'll consider taking sort of uh, a flour mix ready so we can actually make some, some bannock bread and things that will actually add to the curry that we might be uh, cooking that evening. So... There's, you know, you've got to remember the reason you're doing it. It's necessary to keep going. It is about the journey, especially, but uh, not just a, the arriving. But, but certainly, you know, you're passing through some in Scotland, some magnificent countryside, and it seems such a shame to rush it uh, when you've actually just rushed to get away from work and everything else. Yeah, I think there's two things about that though, that 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 are worth just thinking about. I mean, the first thing is dehydrated food itself. I mean, I know everybody's got their favourite brand, or they. They like we do dehydrate stuff yourself because it's better quality, but it is pretty tasteless stuff, and it's tasteless because there's no fat in it. In all honesty, you know, you you you, know, you, you really have to have fat-free food to dehydrate. So, um, and you get bored with it pretty quickly. So, uh, the, the idea of uh, picking up real food wherever you can is quite good. And one of the things I'm going to do this time is I want to carry less food with me. So, I've thought more closely about where I'm stopping, where there are shops. And that night I'll buy a, a, a tin of stew or something rather than mess about, and it'll just give a bit of variety. If you said you're out in the open, you know, you, you have got time to stop. 
and cook something. And it is, it's part of shutting down for the day. It's part of relaxing, isn't it? And it is a, it is a good part of the trip itself. And I know, you know, you're like me, you, you like the camping experience as much as the walking experience. And, and something like the TGO Challenge, um, you know, that when I reflected back on the first one, I thought I didn't do enough while camping. So um, I think on every challenge I've done, apart from a night in the Tarside Hostel, every night has been under canvas, uh, most nights camping rough, because it's just the best experience you can have. Well, it's all about changing routines and, and certainly getting away from normality, and, and normality for most of us, sadly, these days is sitting in front of a computer in some format or other and ploughing through the day's tasks. But uh, we've had a good chat, and it's certainly um, reached our, our sort of designated time, so um, I wish you well for your, for your trip. I'm very envious uh, not to be joining you, and you are going this time, and obviously uh, going to have a bit of peace and quiet. I hope you're taking your recording equipment with you so I can actually relive it with you afterwards. But, um, yeah, I hope, it, I hope it all goes well. I am taking the recording machine with me. Um, I said, swore blind last year I wouldn't do it, but I am. And uh, that'll be striking fear into the hearts of TGO challengers who are listening to this in advance. Uh, when they realise who it is now, you see them scuttling off, don't you? <laughs> you know, you're not going to get me on that bloody thing. So, but, as we always say, if you're on the TGO challenge or you're in the Scotland area when we're walking through come up and say hello and have a chat but for the moment we're going to say goodbye and wish you all well and hopefully uh, get out and enjoy the uh, the fair weather while it lasts this bank holiday weekend bye for now Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear more from our extensive free library, please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. You can now follow The Outdoor Station on Facebook, where we chat about each programme we produce, answer questions and discuss future productions. Why not join us there? This podcast is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk. 